There we go. Good. Perfect. Do appreciate you taking questions. So we'll go really quickly. So I should uh, just mention I saw that I was only scheduled to speak, and so I said, "Wait a minute! I've never come to RMA and not taken questions. They're going to think I'm scared. So let's go." <laughs> exactly. No, we appreciate that. And and I, I will say very quickly before number mic number one, thank you for your ferocity of fighting for Alberta. 100%. It's so appreciated, uh, and definitely we'll we'll get those numbers. We'll show what the carbon tax impact has been to these these folks as well. Love this it. is the only safe room that I can say this. There's, I'm Paul McLaughlin. I have guns. I have lots of guns. <laughs> I can't do that anywhere else. M Mike number one, please. Good morning, Premier Smith. Karina Williams, Reeve, Northern Sunrise County. Albertans were promised the new victim service zonal model would be an improvement to a 30-year model that worked. Sadly, this is not the case. 30-year veterans are told they no longer fit the model and are even out escorted out of the building. I ask you to please relook at this model before we have families that receive devastating news and an RCMP officer is pulled away to an action call and that crying family is left alone because victim services will no longer be there. Thanks for your, your comment, and I know we've met with, uh, with you about this as well. I'd encourage you to meet with Mike Ellis, the Minister of Public Safety and Emergency Services. The, the, what we observed is that with victim services, there were, there were gaps in coverage, and so uh, this predated me that they were working on making sure everyone had coverage. I know that that has caused some disruption for people who were in the victim services that were long-standing. I think the hope was that most of those individuals with their great expertise would be grandfathered in, but you'll have to talk with uh, with Mike to see if it's not working perfectly in some areas. We have heard gratitude from those areas where they weren't covered before because that, that's the, the, whole, um, the whole purpose is to make sure that everyone has access to victim services. So that's what we were trying to accomplish here. And if there's a, a few um, glitches along the way, talk with Mike and see if he can address those for you. Thank you. Thank you, Premier. We'll go to microphone number two, please. Barb Shepard, Reeve, Lacombe County. As many, of, well, all of you know, we had many Ukrainians come to mm -hmm. this country and settle in Alberta, and uh, with the benefit of a three-year work permit from the federal government. These, uh, some of these people have, um, or most of them, have really good jobs. However, um, they're now closing in on two and a half, two to two and a half years here, with no f idea of how they're going to secure. Uh, further work per permits when the ones expire. And my understanding is that many of them have been faced with having to hire immigration lawyers to help them with this work. So I'm just wondering what the province is planning to do to help facilitate them to stay here. Because obviously, sending them back is not a solution. No, I think everyone had hoped that the conflict um, in Ukraine was going to be temporary. And so I We'll have to do some more work with the federal government to figure out how they can do the extension. I mean, the, the CUIT application or the CUIT uh, visa process turned out to, to work re really well for the Ukrainians who were settling here. I think we ended up, and uh, I'm sure Mohammed Hussein can correct me if I've got the wrong figure, I think we settled almost 65,000 individuals in Alberta, and f very few of them are reliant on, on government services. Most of them, as you say, have either started a business or are working. So now here we find ourselves with no, uh, no, no clear idea of when that conflict is going to end. And many people, after being here two, two and a half years, they very likely, uh, at least a portion of them, would want a pathway to, to stay permanently. The, the federal government made a big mistake in 2023, and they just opened the floodgates on all of their different programs. Nor normally, we had about 400 to 500,000 people coming to our country. In 2023, it was almost 2 million. And so it was international students and temporary foreign workers and asylum seekers and the evacuee program and uh, permanent immigration and all of its various streams. And, and all of the provinces are, are now bending under the weight of that. So I understand that they are trying to correct, but they're correcting the wrong way. They should be uh, giving the priority to those who have come, got settled, fitting in, have a job, self-supporting. That's exactly the reason why we have the program that we do. So um, Mohammed Yassin has been working uh, since he got in to try to allow for a greater number to go through our provincial nominee program. And our efforts were initially rewarded. We got over 10,000 that uh, we were allowed to bring through through that program. And then this past year, they reduced it. 
we, 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 think we would like to advocate for something more like Quebec. Quebec chooses 55% of the newcomers to their province, which would give us more latitude to be able to, to create more avenues for, for folks to stay. So it is, uh, it is on our radar. There may be a change of government at the federal level, which may allow us to have a little bit more success in advocating for our position. But I take your point that we're getting down to, to crunch time. So, uh, so I talk about that with Mohammed Yassin when, when he's up on the stage, and, and he and I will take it away to see if there's more we can do. Thank you, Premier. We'll go to microphone number three, please. Dale Hedrick, County of St. Paul. Uh, what I'm up here for is the distribution lines for our hamlets. They're failing, and we need some money. So elaborate a little bit more. What, uh, when you say that, the, that they're failing, what do you mean by that? You mean the hamlets themselves are failing? The distribution lines, the water and sewer lines. Oh, I see what you're saying. Like all across Alberta, they're 60 years old and yeah. time to be replaced, and we don't have the money to do it. What is the cost that you're looking at for, for being able to upgrade those? I believe it was $17 million just for our little hamlets. And how, what's your overall amount of money that, that uh, you get, that you generate each year, just so I have an idea of scale? Like, uh, like from the... the just what, what's your operating revenues each year I'd from your to, tax base? I don't have the exact number with me. Which county are you? County of St. Paul. St. Paul? So, I, I, so is it like, would it require 100% of your revenues in a year to be able to pay that, or...? No, like we just need a helping hand with some grants. That's all. Like, yeah. like we're gonna put a uh, the, the user pay as well. Yeah. But we just need a hand. And well, talking to other municipalities, yeah. they're in the same boat as us. Well, look, I mean, here's the the challenge that we face is that in the the big cities, as you know. Um, EPCOR and uh, the water utility in Calgary, they were supposed to be funded on a user pay model as well. And some of the, it sounds like EPCOR did a, a pretty good job of keeping um, on top of those repairs. And then Calgary, of course, had the major problems in the past year. And our position to Calgary has been that this is supposed to be something that is funded out of rate base. I mean, it's a utility so that the, the fees associated with maintaining that that service should be there's certain portion should be set aside to pay for the capital repairs so i would just put that out that 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 should be the model in all communities now we know that when we build new lines that there is a, a funding program that we assist with but we would probably need to have rma work with us to see if there's some way to bridge from where we are to where we need to be so that those can be fully funded and that the dollars are put aside as they're needed it, it uh, doesn't help us now if we've got sort of a, a major uh, infrastructure deficit on that front. We can't obviously have water systems failing all over the province, but we have to, to figure out a model that's gonna be sustainable going forward without creating the expectation that we're just going to step in every time there's a problem. Otherwise, we'd be on the hook for hundreds of millions of dollars in Calgary. And we think that their ratepayers should should have paid enough over this time to be able to repair that themselves. So let's uh, let's see if there's, uh, I need to sort of understand the nature of the problem, I think, Paul, to get an idea of how many of your jurisdictions find themselves in that situation. And then we'll have to talk with Devin Dreeshen, who's our Minister of Transportation and Economic Corridors, who funds that program, to see if there's some cost sharing that we can get us to a, a fully uh, user pay system. For sure, thank you, Premier. We've actually done a report just recently on, on bridges, uh, roads, and utilities. So we do have that information, Good. so we'll definitely share it with Minister Dreeshen's office, as well as yourself and Mr. McIver. Uh, and, and his is a more local point, but it's about a $3 billion liability to get the assets up to a condition uh, and the return on investments less than seven years. So I think there's a significant opportunity. We'll work with, with, uh, with your ministries and work with you, Premier, and we'll share that information. We'll be Perfect. having a bit of a session today to talk about that too as well. So thank you for the question. Yeah, thank you. We'll go to the next mic. Mic number one, please. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Premier. I talked to you uh, the other night about municipal taxes, and I did hear at the Urban Convention that you threw it out that uh, what would it look like if Alberta collected municipal taxes. Um, I would ask anyone in this room to stand up if you think that's a good idea. And the only ones standing are from Saskatchewan, so you can see it isn't. 
<laughs> so thank you. Um, I hope you'll take that to heart. And uh, it's one place we don't need your help. So thank you. Well, look, I mean, I was asked a question about why we don't have our own separate personal income tax collection system. And it's because when we uh, talked with Quebec about what it would cost to set it up, they said one and a half billion dollars, which is the amount of money that we want to deliver in a tax cut to, to citizens. So it didn't, it doesn't really make sense for us to have a separate tax collection system as a province by we're able to piggyback on the federal but we would still have 320 different um, municipal uh, tax collection systems so I would just put it to you because I have had others talk to me in the past of it whether there's an opportunity for shared services that maybe you maybe you don't need to have 320 property property tax collection departments maybe there are ways for you to be able to find some um, some savings that way maybe um, and I can tell you I think there are, it may be maybe more appetite about it in the in the towns and cities with AUMA um, than there than there is here and that's fair but we're, I think we'd be open to providing the service if somebody, if somebody wanted us to, because uh, a portion of the bill you're collecting and remitting to us, and then you're getting the blame for the 100% um, of, the, of the charge, because people don't know the difference between uh, uh, municipal and education taxes. I'm not interested in upsetting any apple carts that don't need upsetting, but I do always hear uh, from municipalities that there's a strain on resources that can't go towards the front line, and finding new ways to do things so that we can simplify and this um, ha you know having 320 different tax collection departments seems to be an area where if you we can find some efficiencies there we should be looking to it at the present time there still is nothing in place to ensure that in 20 years the owners of the land and the owners of the lease will walk away and leave us with huge liabilities. Completely. I mean, part of the reason for the pause was exactly that, is we're sending the message now to those who are building solar and wind installations that they will be required to put money aside so that at the end of life, the money is there for them to be able to do the reclamation. We're still in the process of building out the framework for that. We, we, we uh, did indicate to them that we want an agriculture first approach, that we need the 35 kilometer viewscape uh, buffer zone. We're working on a buffer zone, and maybe RMA can help with this. We're working on what the buffer zone should be from home quarters as well, because I have heard stories in my own area of individuals who are impacted by turbines on their neighbor's property and now not able to use and enjoy their property the way they did before. So we want to be able to put all of that in place and then also have a mechanism where they put aside a certain amount each year to get it to a, to a, a level where that it can continue to grow with compound interest so that at the end of life they're able to, to remove it. And part of the reason is it is so important, for especially for wind turbines, is with all that concrete and steel and the blades, we've, we've been told it could be as much as a million dollars to remove and reclaim those sites. And so that's a lot of money. And if there isn't some kind of pot of money put aside and it changes hands multiple times, there's no orphan tur wind turbine program like there is for our Orphan Well Association for Oil and Gas. There's no orphan solar program either. So we're relying on the contracts that private landowners are making and then we need to be able to hold them to account. So that. That is something that is in process. And just know we're starting the conversation with the energy sector too, because this is probably what we should have done with oil and gas as well, is that rather than just having them continue to push forward the liability so that 60 or 70 years in, we have all these suspended wells that are dotting the countryside, they should have also been required to put money away so that when, uh, when, when assets got transferred, the money to reclaim went along with it. So we have a huge unfunded liability on that front in the rearview mirror, but there's no reason why we have to continue that practice going forward. So we want to be consistent on all of that. There's still a little bit more uh, regulatory work that needs to be done around it, but that is the intention that we have for exactly the reason that you pointed out, because we don't want to leave the landowner left holding the bag on this. So thanks for, for raising it. And, and talk with Minister Nathan Newdorf about that, because he's, he's going to be working to set up the regulatory framework around that. So thanks for the question. Great, thank you, Premier. And, and just a shout out to Minister Newdorf has been a great friend of RMA too, so appreciate. He's been great to work with Excellent. too as well. Good. Microphone number three, we'll just do two more questions just to keep an eye on time here. So microphone three and then we'll go to one, please. Thank you, uh, good morning, Madam Premier. Even without the carbon tax, rural Albertans are paying astronomical transmission and distribution fees for electricity, making power 
almost unaffordable with many fees being two to three times the cost of power. Will the province impose a cap and make power affordable for rural Albertans? Thank you for that. And I can tell you, Ron Weeb, yeah. Ron Weeb, the, uh, the the MLA from Grand Prairie, has been uh, tireless in in uh, bringing in the bill the bills to show how unfair it is, especially in northern Alberta. the The issue that the way we want to move on this, um, and again, Minister Newdorf is going to be sounds like he's going to be pretty busy in your bear pit session with the questions coming up. But we we really need to move to what, what is described as a postage stamp rate for distribution charges, so that everybody pays the same for the wires across the the province. And um, otherwise, we're going to end up with the most productive and wealth generating areas of our province, which are increasingly moving north, being the ones that also have the highest rates. And it's going to end up impacting our ability to attract new, uh, especially industrial installations. So, yes, I mean, the, the, when, when Newdorf got in there, he found that every part of the electricity system was broken. We were generating the wrong type of power, too much solar and wind and not enough base load. We had a problem with economic withholding, with companies holding back power to increase the rates, which was spiking them. We had a problem with uh, one municipality in particular charging an outrageous local access fee that, was, um, that ended up generating in Calgary, I think, an extra $250 million last year. We had a regulated rate option that was available to our most vulnerable citizens, thinking they were protected, and it was the most volatile and, and, um, um, and highest rate. It went, spiked up to 32 cents a kilowatt hour. And then we also ended up with an overbuild on transmission, which we're all paying for, and this unfairness when it comes to distribution. So he has had to chip away at every part of the system to develop a new framework so that we can address all of those. And that is, that is the next step. So we've heard you loud and clear. We know it's not fair, and we're going to fix it. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Premier. We'll go to microphone number one, please. 